I want to start with, were you at any point back and forth over how you might be perceived back home? Because there hasn't ever been a Miss Saudi Arabia, and, and that's a damn shame. Before I went to the competition, I thought, what am I getting myself into? And how am I going to compete with girls who have done this tens of times? And I thought I was crazy. And then with time, when I did make it and I did start modeling, they would come up to me and say, oh, I saw your picture. You looked really nice. Tell them to keep that same energy that they had 10 years ago, however long ago it was. You attract everything in your life. So I attracted being here. I watched your show. I loved your show. And I imagined myself being on your show before actually coming here. Did you know that? No, I didn't. It's funny that I, I reached out to you. 15 years ago, if you asked me where would you be at 27, I would tell you probably I'm married with kids, a stable job. And look at me now, I'm 27, still stumbling and um, searching for myself. Would you do it again? You have experience now. Yeah. I want to take part in Miss Universe. Welcome to another episode of the Mo Show podcast. Today, I have a very unique guest. The first time I saw her was on Instagram uh, during the Saudi Cup, the famous horse race that is in, God, I don't know how many years it's been in existence, but it keeps growing every year. A picture, a couple of pictures of her went viral. And uh, I was like, I need to know who she is. Uh, because I would like her on my show. Uh, a doctor, a model, she's done some acting and participated in Napoli at the beauty pageant. Is it pageant or pageant? Pageant. Pageant. <laughs> As the first Miss Saudi Arabia. Rahaf, thank you so much for joining me on the Mo Show. Thank you for having me and thank you for the warm welcome. Well, it's my pleasure, uh, Rahaf. And you know what? It, um, it means even more to me knowing that this is the first long form conversation that you've ever been a part of. Uh, you mentioned that even on social media, I mean, you don't talk into the camera, you know, it's more like, you know, pictures or, 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 or boomerangs. You've never really had an interview. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you. I've um, wanted to reserve me talking on camera or to the public until I found something meaningful, mm -hmm. until I found a pr platform that uh, resembles what I believe in. And you do that perfectly. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And even before uh, we started shooting, you, uh, I, I didn't realize how many of the shows of mine you watched. And, uh, and for you to say what you said uh, in terms of how much you appreciate the quality and the podcast really helps and encourages me to keep going. Because you, the, the beauty of this is that I, I shoot, I publish, I don't know who I'm touching. And for you to come in and say, Mo, your episodes and, and your growth and, and, and just makes me want to go even further. I've been a fan of the show, um, I think, for the past couple of years. And uh, once I was talking to my life coach and I told him that if I had to choose any show in Saudi Arabia to be on, it would be the Mo show. And I'm so glad it happened. Means a lot to me. What pulled you into the field initially of, uh, of medicine? Okay, so I'm from a big family and um, most of my uncles and cousins are doctors or in the medical field, pharmacists, nurses. So it was kind of a choice. I was expected somehow to end up in medicine, but the real reason I actually considered um, having a medicine as a career was uh, started when I was 17 years old. We just moved back from London to Riyadh. And I just finished my GCSE, which is equivalent to the SATs in the States. And um, uh, I went to school, an American school here uh, in Riyadh. So uh, we used to finish school around 1 or 2 p.m. and we had so much free time. Uh, and moving from country to country, we didn't know that much people. Entertainment 10 years ago was very limited. Non-existent. Exactly. So here my dad interfered and um, signed me and two of my sisters as uh, volunteers and in uh, Senate Cancer Society, which is a children's hospital for cancer patients. Uh, we started going every few weeks and then with occasions if any of the children had um, 
a birthday party or if there was Eid or Ramadan, Girgayan, we would go and volunteer in anything we can. Maybe organizing, maybe painting on kids' faces or buying them gifts. So it started there and it would bring me so much joy and happiness to see those kids happy because of something I did, even when it was something very silly. Um, here, I thought to myself, if doing something that simple or that small could bring me this much joy, what if I did something bigger, if I had a greater impact on those children's lives? So initially, um, I wanted uh, to study oncology, which is a study of uh, cancer cells, a diagnosis and uh, cancer diagnosis and treatment. Um, obviously, when I told my parents, they were thrilled and they were very happy because that's the career they hoped I would uh, choose or end up in. Medicine. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. The seed was planted when, when you had that interaction with the kids. And that's when you knew that you wanted yeah. to do that. Um, they, medicine was always a choice. It was always on the table, you know, but I didn't really see myself in medicine until I actually uh, went to the cancer society and started dealing with the children. Mm. I had, uh, I won't deny, I had a lot of guidance and um, encouragement from my family because obviously they're all in the medical field. So it wasn't hard for me to know the process or the grades I needed or the exams I needed to take to get into medicine. Yeah. You mentioned that you were a nerd a few moments ago. Yeah. Um, has that helped you in your schooling days? Yes. I learn and I have a photographic memory. Really? Yeah. I have a very, very good memory. Does it serve you well? Does it serve you both positively and negatively? Yes. I don't forget anything. You don't forget anything. If you did me wrong, I would never forget. <laughs> never. You just cut those people out of your life exactly. silently. What was it like uh, living outside of Saudi for the first, I don't know, maybe what was it, 10 years of, of, of your life you were out of Saudi? Yes. Yeah. How, how was that uh, compared to when you eventually moved back? Do you look back on your years abroad fondly? Actually, I've never lived in Saudi before the age of 17. Really? Yes. Okay. So all your all your years were, were outside of Saudi, then you moved back eventually when you went into university. Yeah. Okay. So I know I'm very fortunate that I got to uh, live in multiple countries and multiple cities and have that experience from a very young age, being exposed to different environments. I think it builds your personality in a different way. Mm. Yeah. So I know I was very fortunate and I'm very grateful for these stages of my life. But you know, when you live or move from place to place, you start to compare unconsciously. Yeah. So I know that I am very fortunate and lucky to have been able to live and be exposed to different countries and cultures from a very young age. Uh, but you know, when you move from place to place, or in my case, from continent to continent, you mm -hmm. compare subconsciously. It's normal. Yeah. So in the beginning, I didn't really fit in Saudi or I didn't see myself living here forever. Now I would never leave Saudi. <laughs> I love living in Saudi and I love living in Riyadh. Um, it opened my eyes on areas which we usually take for granted. For example? Like how well people are raised in Saudi, the manners. Al-Qiyam, Al-Karam, you know, these things that I have never seen anywhere else in the world. Fa, it made me appreciate my country and be proud to be Saudi. You know, during Eid, you get a chance to realize how fortunate we are to have such a close-knit community or a close-knit family where we're not just seeing our parents or our siblings we're seeing our cousins, our second cousins, sometimes third cousins. And, and Eid is always a time of year when I realize that that's one of the strongest things about the Arab culture is how close families are together. Because in the States, it's not that. Yeah, of course. It's normal for, it, for, it, for a kid to leave the house at 18 and, and he sees uh, his family during Christmas and Thanksgiving, if that. What, I, what really caught my attention 
uh, when I first moved back is the the good nature of people. People are actually good with no intention behind it. So I know for a fact if I was driving and I got a flat tire, everyone would stop. They would check up on me. They tried to help. They would even be afraid for my my well-being if if I needed anything, if I was panicking. You know, and I don't be- think- Because of that, not, not because of what will happen to you, because what might be going on in your head that, oh my God, I have a flat tire. How am I going to get home? Yeah. Relax, don't worry, I'm here. Yeah, they would help yeah. me without even asking who I am or my, yeah. what my name was. Complete strangers. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. Offer them cash and, and watch them run away from you. <laughs> Actually, they'll probably be insulted. If you say, here you go, thank you so much, they, you, you know, you're probably, off, probably better off not offering them anything. Exactly. But you're right. And I've said that a bunch of times on episodes that our people have such good hearts and intentions and we don't get credit for that. Exactly. What happens at the end of a meal with Arabs on the table? You had a meal, waiter puts the bill on the table. What happens? Everyone's racing to pay the bill. No, that's when you see people lose their mind over, I want to pay the bill. Exactly. That's karam. That's generosity. I don't know if that happens in other cultures, Raf. I, I don't think it happens. And, you know, this is what makes us attractive or stand out from the rest of the world. Our values. Yeah. And that's going to spill over to, like, it's so timely. And, and honestly, as we open up to the world, tourism, they get a chance to see the definition of hospitality. And already people that come through, they're like, my God, you know, it's, um, it, you people are so hospitable. Uh, every single region, if there's one thing that all regions have in common, obviously accents change, uh, dress changes, but one thing that all 13 regions have in common is generosity. And our values. Yeah. 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 I see Europeans all the time in Riyadh. They're like, your country's amazing. Your people are amazing. We didn't know that. Mm. And you know what we have that the Gulf countries don't have? The indigenous people represent over 90%. Wow. When you go to the Gulf countries, no, the, the tourists represent 90% plus. Yeah. The local, Lil Bastob, they're rare. You don't see them. But, but here, it's the opposite. That's All true. you will see is Saudis. Yeah. And that's amazing. Yeah, truly, truly. Uh, I'm so excited. Actually, I read something yesterday that said uh, the Ministry of Tourism is investing $600 million dollars on 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 marketing and campaign and getting the word out there to the world that Saudi is open for tourism and it's the most it's the number one country in 2023 in terms of budget that is being spent on tourism to show you how serious they're taking it um and then i think of the red sea projects that are opening end of the year which makes me think I'm never going to go to the Maldives again. Um. <laughs> you know, when I'm abroad, when I when I was in the States uh, in 2019, I would just go and market Saudi. I'll show everyone pictures of Alhuna. I'll show everyone pictures of the Red Sea yeah. and tell them about Neom and tell them about our, our mega projects. You're a little ambassador, aren't you? I try to. Yeah, well, you were you were put in a position where you had to be on, on an individual level. If I got a chance, Yanni, why not? Yeah, yeah. You... Um, have a bit of experience acting. I want to know what kind of acting, and I'm interested in that because I always wanted to be an actor. Did not, didn't end up being an actor, ended up being a podcaster, kind of the same thing, cameras pointing at me. Yeah. Uh, what kind of acting did you do, and do you still do it, and do you enjoy it? Tell me everything. So my first acting experience was um, in 2021, and uh, I shot a series that was released last summer. It's uh, called Ayal Nof. Uh, based on a, a true story that took the social media and um, the world by storm when it got known and released. It's about a lady who kidnaps babies from the nurseries. My God. So yeah, it's, it's crazy, based though. on a real story uh, where this woman uh, takes, abducts children from the nursery since they're like two or three days old. And she kept them in the house for 25 years until she got discovered. So this was my first acting experience. And I'm, I'm not done talking about this, uh, this thing. What role did you play? Where can we watch this? Tell me more about this lady who abducts. <laughs> it's just chilling. Uh, okay, I played... Um, uh, Don't tell me the lady. No, uh, no, 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 no. I was the innocent, uh, sweet, uh, stupid 
girl that loves her mom so much. And unfortunately, this um, this uh, character was very similar to me. She was very calm. She didn't want her family to um, like go into problems and just uh, like she wanted to keep her family together even though she knew her mom was doing something wrong, but she would always defend her and have her back. So and in the show, the mother would like um, abuse everyone physically, except for me. Okay. So uh, why did I go into acting? Why? In 2021, I had just finished my internship in hospital and I had a couple of months until I started working officially. A producer came to me and he told me that we have this show and we think you're the perfect character for this role. Um, So I thought to myself, why not? And what really caught my attention, the way he explained to me that this this show was going to be done uh, in a way that hasn't been done in Saudi drama before, it's going to be very realistic, even like makeup and hair there was going to be no makeup no hair to the point that they would actually uh, try to um, mimic a vitamin deficiency on skin and like put spots on the nails and the skin to show that these children are uh, physically abused and uh, they don't go out in the sun they have vitamin deficiency so that was interesting but the thing that really um, made me think of this was uh, when he told me, he told me that you're a model. You um, get uh, makeup and hair done by professionals. You get photographed in the best way, with the best angle, best lightning. Everyone sees your pictures on Instagram. Wouldn't it be nice if you could show them another side of you? Hmm. Show them that you have more to offer than just like posting pictures on Instagram? It's a light bulb right there. Yeah, so I said, yeah, I, I do have more to offer than just a pretty face on Instagram. I have more to offer. So maybe this could be a challenge. I did. It was a challenge for me on a personal and professional level. And I won't deny it wasn't easy um, for me to go on camera with no makeup, with messy hair, wearing like very terrible clothes. Mm. But um, it's good that you got uncomfortable though. Yeah. I got through it and within like the second week of shooting I was fine amazing I'd see my hair like crazy and no makeup and I'd wear like the worst outfits and I was fine with that yeah would you consider doing and have you done another one since I'm actually gonna start shooting next month a leading role it's gonna be a like a love story but at the same time um it's gonna discuss uh, cultural issues or uh, issues in our society. So that initial role got you this one? I would say so. Yeah, typically how it works in, in, in the acting world. Yeah, like. I got a couple of um, offers after the show. That's amazing. And the show was actually nominated for Joy Awards, but unfortunately it didn't win. It didn't this. win, but you got nominated. Not me, the show itself. The show did, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It was a surprise for all of us. Like, all the leading roles were new faces. Mm -hmm. So, alhamdulillah. You know, um, it's just amazing to hear that a Saudi girl can have a job as an actor or actress. And it can be perceived as something that is totally fine. Because a decade ago, no. Ahad Kamil went through a lot. Yeah her words it wasn't easy and now it's an honorable it's great it's professional it won't be met with raised eyebrows exactly awesome even like uh if if you're a singer you're an artist adi it's welcomed we want that they want that in saudi we're looking for uh singers actors musicians djs if two years from now i'm looking at how quickly now now stay with me okay I'm looking at how quickly Margaret Robbie's career went through the roof. Mm. It was five or six films from her debut, five, six or seven, I don't know, we'll we'll check, but it wasn't that many before she was in a Scorsese picture. Like 
you know the old saying um, uh, your mom's uh, prayers are answered she just went she leaped from one to another and then she was with Will Smith in focus and then she was in Wolf of Wall Street with Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio like it was a quick jump to stardom here's the question if one day a big Hollywood production comes to you and says that we need you for the female role in this movie with some uh, A-lister and an A-lister director and leading role. You you get where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. What would you say? With a heartbeat, I would say okay. You would say okay? Really? I um, mean, why would I miss a chance like that? So would it be a, a personal goal of yours or something that you would, since you're in your second one now, maybe beginning of 24, you do your third and fourth? You know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm juggling through life now. I don't know exactly where I'm heading. I'm acting, I'm modeling, I'm working in hospital. I don't know where I'm going to end up. And that's fine. I seriously don't know where I'm yeah. going to end up. But are you happy? Yeah, I think um, I have so much potential and I don't want to waste any of it. I love if, that I, I love that you know what you are and you own it. The if, fact that you said, I have so much potential. I, I love that you perceive yourself that way. Thank you, but it's true. I think I can do more than just working in a regular job. Yeah. I can do a regular job. I can do a side job. And I can, from time to time, act. Why not? Yeah. <laughs>
we went back and forth and they made sure I was telling the truth that we don't have uh, that type of competitions here in Saudi. And you are the first to want to explore this venture. Even more of a reason for them to welcome you with open arms. I think they were afraid. They were afraid that, that you'd I, win it. No, that I do political issues or like political problems for mm. them. I don't know. But that's the feeling, or that's the message they tried to send me. Okay. Yeah, I went to Napoli. When I got the email that I was accepted, I was I couldn't believe my eyes. So you, you did not take no for an answer, and you. Yeah. I sent tens of emails using using the words human rights, something that's always women's thrown in right. our face. Exactly. Women's rights, human rights, whatever. And because you pushed back on them saying no, they eventually said, all right, then come. Yeah, they thought I wouldn't do it. I love that. I love the persistence in that. I mean, they didn't give me a good reason just because I'm Saudi. That yeah. doesn't make sense No, no, to no, me. no. That's just uh, that's discrimination. Exactly. They're at telling us we're racist and and then they're they're doing that. Exactly. How contradicting uh, of them to do that. Okay, so you get to Napoli. Did you have the, the best no. pizza in the world over there? Unfortunately, I didn't. Okay, <laughs> so um, I got the email of my acceptance in October 2021, and the competition was going to take ap- uh, was going to be in April 2022. I had six months to prepare. I didn't know anything. Okay. I, ha- I don't know from where to start. Should I talk to a dietitian? Should I talk to a stylist, a personal trainer? Uh, should I talk to someone that can train me to walk or talk on stage? You didn't. You didn't know any models who you can reach out to for advice. No, I didn't know anything. So um, it's very, very sorry, very brave of you to want to go into something you know nothing about, having spoken to no one, and being persistent enough to feel that no, this is something that you want to do regardless of the very little information that you have on it. It says a lot about your character. I had no idea what I was doing, honestly. So what I did was bit by bit, I told my life coach and I didn't want to tell everyone. I didn't want anyone to talk me out of it. I knew that like maybe someone could say something and make me doubt myself or change my mind. So I kept very quiet about it and I told only people who were directly concerned or involved in preparing me. My life coach, my personal trainer and a stylist. I tried to look for someone that can train me to walk on stage because you know you get judged by the walk. The catwalk. The catwalk, it's it's different when in a beauty pageant. Okay. Um, Everything's different, surely it's nothing like real life. There's no trainers here in Saudi. So what I did was I would open Miss Universe and try to mimic. On YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what Self-taught, I did. Self-taught, yeah. And bit by bit, obviously I was on a very strict diet. I had no carbs for like two months. Okay, sorry about the pizza question. <laughs> you know. Um, not, I, e- not easy, huh? Abedin, it's not thing. easy. And you know, having a very low carb diet makes you very stressed. Mm. I was very easily irritated. Anyone would say anything and I'd just like jump in their face. Anyway, the competition was uh, last April. It was Ramadan. And I arrived to Rome and then I took a train to Napoli. And when I arrived to Napoli, you know, Napoli is a small city. It's not like any big city. Yep. So when I ra- arrived to Napoli, I felt like I was this small ambitious girls with girl with big dreams i i was just looking around me in napoli no one speaks english unfortunately and there are no taxis after 10 p.m so i found myself in a city alone in ramadan and it was cold i felt like i was in a movie from a scene like i felt like this this is this was one of the moments that changed me Reality hit you. Yeah, reality hit, exactly. So uh, we had training for um, two weeks before the actual show day. Um, I met uh, the girls and everything. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, the backstage or the reality behind 
that type of show isn't as glamorous as it may seem. I would have told you that. It's very toxic in many ways. So most of the girls um, didn't speak English. I and even the people in charge, they barely spoke English. The first day we met with the sponsors and had a conference conference meeting. And then uh, we would wake up every day at 7 a.m. and go to the bus and start uh, the tourist sites. We had tourist sites and we had photo shoots. We had interviews and we had rehearsals for the show. There were many things that I didn't like, but I didn't want to be the spoiled Saudi that was complaining about everything. <laughs> Even though everyone was complaining, but I didn't complain at all. I didn't want anyone to say, we shouldn't have accepted her in the first place. Yeah. You didn't want to give them ammunition. Exactly. Bravo. So I was, I don't like the hotel. I don't like the food. I don't like the way they were treating us. But I didn't say anything because halas, yani, I'm already here. There's nothing that can be done. Good attitude. Uh, they, we were forced, forced to go on a diet. It wasn't an option. Our breakfast would be um, a cup of coffee and a diet biscuit only. And then for lunch, like six hours later, we would have uh, three pieces of strawberry, half a lettuce, and uh, one toast without the edges. Oh, so they were generous enough to give carbs. Yeah, exactly. But no edges. Dinner? Uh, dinner it would be the same as lunch, or maybe it would be... It, it was very horrible. Dinner, I remember once we had um, sweet corn with tuna and steamed rice, and it wasn't like a meal it was like scattered rice you know yeah like it was barely there um it makes i don't want to say but it was just actually disgusting to look at yeah thanks for being honest about that and, and not keeping that in um how did your body react to that kind of nutritional program i lost weight which but, was a good thing but in a not healthy way i feel no it wasn't healthy even the last few days before the show, uh, we were restricted with water. Yani even water was very carefully calculated. Really? Because they we didn't they didn't want us to get water retention. Uh huh. Okay. A few more things that I would like to mention, and I think it's very important that people know that beauty pageants in general don't only depend on your physical appearance only. Beauty pageants measure your intellect your education, your giving to the community, uh, your talent, your personality, the way you communicate with uh, the public or the audience, plus your physical appearance. So it measures many aspects that I don't think everyone is aware of that. So we always see Methan Miss Universe, uh, a girl that's less attractive wins than the most attractive and why is that? It's because it's not only measured by physical appearance. And I think that's so important that everyone knows that beauty pageants aren't only about your physical appearance. They measure many aspects. Intellect. Education. Uh, education. I like the part of uh, what you do for the community. Yeah. Because it's not about, it's not all about looks and life isn't all about looks. So I like, it's like the only thing I liked about what you just said in terms of how they run their business is that we don't choose you based on your looks. A few other verticals go into that. Yeah. Yeah. So then, how did they choose the, the day where the the actual, yeah the winner? Like, how was that okay. experience like? So uh, we have a couple of rounds. We were seventy girls from different countries, um, and the first one, the first part was a gown, and then the second part. I don't know if I should be mentioning this. It was a bikini part, but I didn't take part in the bikini, so I got less points. I wore a one piece. I, I'm not saying like I was very, very modest, but as, at least, Yanni, I wore a one piece and a scarf. The like, that's the only way they would accept me. Anyway, and the third part was um, like a talent, and they had to dance and stuff like that. Uh, I came in from the top 10. 
out of um, out of 70 out of 70 it's amazing yeah and sure. the girl who won um was from kazakhstan and she was a very nice girl not just on the outside she was actually nice to people yeah good human yeah exactly and i was very happy for her so cultural differences let's say stopped you from scoring top three maybe and the part that i didn't have any experience before that before I went to the competition, I thought, what am I getting myself into? And how am I going to compete with girls who have done this tens of times? And I thought I was crazy. Would you do it again? You have experience now. Yeah. I want to take part in Miss Universe. Even though Miss Universe have an age limit, I think, of 28. And I'm turning 28 next year, so. One more year? Really, after 28, you can't uh, do do Miss Universe? That's from what I read on their official <clears throat> website. I don't have to tell you this, but like, please go for it. Uh, you go in there with experience now. Yeah, even though um, I took part, but it's nothing compared to Miss Universe. Miss Universe is like the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? I'm loving, I'm loving the uh, US sports analogy. Um, but all in all, like it uh, was an experience that uh, you learned a lot from, uh, and on a personal, and personal, professional yeah. Level. The world is a is a cruel place, and uh, I appreciated the part where you said that what you see on stage is not like what happens or isn't commensurate with what happens backstage, and and that's real life. People who you see on social media or in on the street aren't the same people who you're going to see. Uh, in a meeting or somewhere else like people portray this image of themselves and when the cameras aren't rolling uh, there is someone else exactly like me when the cameras aren't rolling I'm an asshole no <laughs> <laughs> um, hey. no I try to be the same person I am here as I am in life because I feel there is a lack of real or realism in the world today that's true um, it's funny that you would mention in front of the camera and behind the camera because that's what that what actually happened uh, during the competition. Mm -hmm. We would take group pictures and we would all be hugging each other as soon as the camera stops. Like you'd see Truth other faces. Comes out, huh? Exactly. The Saudi World Cup horse race. That's when I got to uh, discover you. What was that like? Uh, I saw you wearing a bunch of outfits. Uh, I was like, mashallah, you know, this girl is is clearly a model. She's beautiful. Um, I want to know her story. And, um, and I want to know what that whole experience was like. Because you look at the Saudi horse race or the Saudi World Cup, and it's more of a fashion show than anything horse related. Looking back, how was your experience in the whole bit? Thank you for saying that. That's very nice of you. So the Saudi Cup is a massive international horse ride, horse race held at King Abdulaziz racetrack in Riyadh. Uh, it's notable for its grand prize of twenty million dollars, which makes it the most uh, prestigious um, horse uh, race in the world. Mm -hmm. I love horses, and uh, that type of uh, those types of events really attract me. So I thought. Um, with such a big event, why not? Why wouldn't I go? So I, I knew there was a dress code for the Saudi Cup, yeah. which was traditional modest. So here I contacted my dear and talented friend, Shogun Barak. She's a fashion designer from Al Ahsa, working with the Commission of Fashion under um, the Ministry of Culture. She, and I can't take credit for anything, came up with uh, the masterpiece I wore to the Saudi Cup. The name of the piece is uh, Lina. Lina means the small branch of a palm tree in Arabic. The white uh, thing that you yeah. wore? The white one, yeah? yeah? Okay. The white cloak. Yeah. So the cloak was uh, made of uh, natural silk. And um, why she was inspired by the palm tree. So as I mentioned, she's a fashion designer from Al Ahsa. And uh, Al Ahsa is known as Medin Til Million Nakhla. They hold a Guinness World Record of an oasis with 2.5 million palm trees. Get out of here. Yeah. My goodness. In one oasis? Yeah. Two and a half million palm trees. Yeah. 
Guinness World Records. Wow. So obviously, uh, we can all relate to palm trees, but especially people from al Yeah, and the pearls that were used to decorate um, the cloak were, were, were also inspired from al They resemble Minat al which is the first uh, seaport in the Arabian Gulf. Whereabouts? Which city? Al-Ahsa. From al Yeah. They have a port over there. The first seaport the in, first the, seaport. in the Arabian Gulf. So that's why she used the palm tree and uh, the pearls to use the Hasawi heritage and make fashion. To represent the sea. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. This part of Saudi I haven't visited yet. I really need to. Me too. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Yeah, I hear really good things about it. Um, so that was one of the uh, dresses that she wore there. Was it a, it was a two day event? Yeah. It's two days, okay. the first day, and the second day is the final. All in all, like it's a fun experience, gets a lot of people good networking. People come up to you be like, oh, nice dress, who made that? Almost you know, almost like a red carpet. Uh, it's amazing how um, by fashion you can send a message and have a strong uh, narrative behind Surely. it. Yeah. And I, I, as I said, I can't take credit for anything because it was all her talent, her she poured her heart into the piece. And I think that's what got people's attention. You could take a bit of credit. I mean, you rocked it. Thank you. So, um, um, of course, uh, the, the the designer gets credit, but you get some too. Um, <clears throat> what's your issue with chicken? Mm. So I haven't had chicken for over 20 years. Bad experience? When I was seven years old, it all started. Um, so when I was really young, I was really attached to one of my aunts and she didn't used to eat chicken. At that time, I think I was like five years old. So I was just blindly copying an adult, a kid copying an adult. And um, it grew into me not eating with my family. If they had chicken for lunch, I wouldn't eat. If we went to a restaurant and my aunt would order anything like meat or fish, I would do the same. I wouldn't eat chicken, no matter what. If I went, uh, like, if I was starving, I wouldn't eat chicken. Wow. So here my dad um, interfered. I think he was trying to teach me a lesson. You know, and that that's, I understand where he's coming from. But uh, so what he used to do was, I, we would sit at the dinner table and he wouldn't allow me to leave my seat except if I had my food, which was chicken, which I hated at that time. And I remember like a scene I would never forget. I was maybe six or seven years old. I was at the dinner table and I was eating my chicken and crying, crying, crying until my dad finally gave up. I had uh, I was low key traumatized. <laughs> from that experience yeah, yeah for sure yeah uh, but you know with time like a few years ago i tried to eat chicken i just couldn't accept it my body wouldn't accept it i don't don't like it i don't like the way it tastes the way it smells got it these trial back you know what and now i think that i don't eat chicken is a blessing because i recently found out i saw our uh, documentaries that show how much uh, hormones chicken have it's crazy i know especially masculine hormones like testosterone mm -hmm. and it affects us all and it affects us all especially women it increases um facial hair it produces acne mm -hmm. it messes up your hormones with men too it messes up their chemical composition uh, yeah. with all the hormones that they do and 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 this especially with the, the fried products the fried yeah. chicken companies they're known to be uh, injected with hormones to to death. Um, if you had to eat chicken, eat local. Local, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What about meat? Uh, Alhamdulillah, I eat everything except okay. for chicken. Okay, got it. So my dad made his point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What advice are you glad that you never listened to away from chicken? <laughs> from 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 all the advice mm -hmm. that you've gotten from people throughout your life. You know, what's something that you're like, thank God I didn't listen to that specific one? It's nothing specific. Um, advice from average people. Average people will give you average advice. 
And if you want to be average, that's fine. But in my case, I know I wanted to do something more. So if I listened to all the advice they gave me, I wouldn't be here today. No. Why didn't you take someone with you to Napoli? I didn't tell anyone I was going, except the people who were directly involved with me. My trainer and my family, that's it. Why? Because I didn't anyone I didn't want anyone to talk me out of it or make me doubt myself. I know like none of my friends would or I think everyone would be supportive. And at the end, uh, when I did go, everyone was very, very supportive and they were very happy for me. But I just didn't want to take the risk of someone making me doubt myself. I couldn't handle that pressure at the time. It was an energy thing as well, right? Exactly. Even if they didn't say it and I felt that they had doubts about me, I just didn't want to take the risk. I mean, you got on a plane, you went to Rome, you took, a, you took a train to Napoli all by yourself. You get there, you're saying it's cold, they don't speak English. Uh, you know, you're trying to figure out where to go to. You're in a place that is far from what you imagined it to be. And you had no support system. No. And then I discovered that the mafia originally are from Napoli, which made me not leave my hotel. <laughs> No comment there. <laughs> Moving on to the next one. Uh, what about with social media? Did you ever have any advice from family members, friends saying, we need more of you on social media, we need less of you on social media? What's your relationship with, with all that? So my parents, especially that I studied medicine and I'm a doctor, think or thought, used to think that social media is in my place. They thought uh, social media was a downgrade from a doctor to someone on social media. I don't think it's only in Saudi. I think it's anywhere in the world. If anyone was in the medical field and they tried to shift, they would get attacked or redirected back to medicine because medicine is a very noble uh, career. Agree. And everyone respects it, unlike social media. Mm. So, do, you, do you think it's either or? No. I think I can, even if social media was really bad place i could use use some of it to my advantage at least yeah yeah definitely spread the word yeah um i think it's a great tool if used correctly of course i don't think it's a great tool when you start comparing yourself with others it's the quickest way to be unhappy my parents compared my two paths with each other you know like doctor social media doctor social media and obviously doctor always won that's why they they didn't see that that was the place for me. Mm -hmm. And I understand completely. And I know they say that out of love um, because they have my best interest at heart. But maybe they don't see the dreams I have. It's such a, it's such a big point and a huge talking point with society parents with children children with parents whereby you have parents who want their child to be x but child doesn't want to be x child wants to be y i don't want to be a lawyer i don't want to be a doctor i actually want to be a football player parents don't want that yeah you know this is back to my point taking advice from average people you know the advice usually comes from people who love you and care about you that's true so when people advise you even if they love you and care about me about you they don't always know where you're going and they don't see the full picture mm -hmm. that only you can see so you just have to really filter the advice you take and f who it's coming from yeah the, the old saying take it with a grain of salt exactly because they haven't walked uh, a day in your shoes or a mile in your shoes for them to uh, give give advice um and and by the way that's where it's won or lost trying to determine which advice you listen to and which you should ignore. If we knew which ad which advice in life we need to listen to and which we should ignore, we would be somewhere else in life. Exactly. Like we would be a hundred times uh, better than, than what we are today. But sometimes we ignore the good advice and take the bad. Sometimes we ignore everything. Sometimes we take everything. And that's fine. Make your own mistakes. Yeah, I think that's important. Very experience is the best teacher one of the ways i filter advice is i look at this person and i see what they've done in their life do i want to end up like that good one, good one. do i want to end up like that if i don't why would i take your advice yeah. if i took your advice 
I would end up like you. Yeah. Some people like their failures in life and they would just tell you, do that, don't do that. Projecting it on you. Exactly. You know? So if it was good advice, why don't you take exactly. it? Exactly. I want to take advice from winners. Exactly. Uh, schooling system is like the only system in the world that hasn't changed in 200 years. It, it bothers me that my son goes into a system now that hasn't changed. Do you know that schooling system started as uh, factory workers? Really? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, they were training uh, factory workers to go. I think it was they were training um, people to go to factories to work because, like, I think three hundred years ago, that's what the industrial revolution. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so we are in school trained the same way they used to train factory workers three hundred years ago. Yeah, it's so dated. It's so dated. The banking system has changed. The medicine field has changed. Work offices. There's. I think the global average of people who now work from home went from five to 15 wow. because of COVID, a 10% globally. The schooling system hasn't changed. Within two years. Yeah, within two years. Like that's it's an insane stat. But I have to be honest, mm. what in life stresses you the most? Wasting time. Time. Wasting time is wasting life. Time is so precious, and we often take that for granted. You know, if an hour or a day goes by, halas, there's no way back. I, you can't get it back. So wasting time, wasting potential stresses me out when I think about it. That's why I would never like waste time with people or go to places that I don't like, socialize events. Wasting time is the worst thing that you can do you guard your time time really is money it's a currency it's the world's number one global currency you know it's even more important than uh, uh money because you can lose money and gain money That's you true. can't gain time, time. back no, you don't you don't uh with prince abdul aziz when he came on because he's uh, a former race car driver in race car you are first or last subject to your timing on the track yeah. so i asked him what's your biggest challenge in life, where we you know where 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 your challenges and his first reference uh, was time, managing his time. It's everything. He literally said time, and then he said nothing for five seconds. I was like, wow, that's powerful. It's like managing my time is 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 the biggest challenge. Um, and and just further to your point, something that that um, that I think of from time to time is like you know, imagine if someone who has passed away was given one more day on earth it's deep i know it's just, it's, just, it's insane but if that one person was given one day on earth what would he do with that day and when i thought of that in my mind i'm like i never want to waste a day if i'm having a bad day it doesn't mean it needs to continue to be a bad day till tomorrow What's your relationship like with the word love and how do you define it deep down? I think love is the greatest feeling on earth. It's amazing. And I think the best or greatest love is the love that makes you a better person. That makes you better, not because someone told you to, not because someone is teaching you, or guiding you to be a better person because you do that for yourself and for them. Unconditional love. Is there enough of it in the world? No. It's almost, you get the feeling like in the last 50 years, it has decreased. There's just more cruelty in yeah. the world. Yeah. You know, you... love is toxic now. That's the most common love, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, when you look back at your parents, I wanted to ask this question earlier, and then we got sidetracked, which is fine. Uh, but speaking of love, uh, appropriate place to enter how your relationship is like with your parents. So when you look back at how you know your 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 mom raised you in your childhood, uh, how would you define your mom, or like what word comes to mind when you think of your mother? I think my mother is the strongest woman in the world. She really is. Is there an example you can share? I mean, 
she got married when she was 19. By the time she was 29, she had seven kids. And she, she raised us all on her own between the States and London. And she raised us well. Seven kids in 10 years? Yeah. While moving th- three countries? Three continents. Uh, that's a that's a story. Can she come on my podcast? <laughs> that's a story in its own. She's a fan of your Mashallah. podcast. Actually. Really, I'm so touched by that. Mashallah. You know, I don't think they make them like that anymore. I don't. No. I mean, like I'm 27 years old, and I can I can't even take care of a cat. <laughs> Seriously, like how did she take care of seven kids? And at your alone? age now, she had six, five, six kids at the age yeah. of 27. Mashallah. Really? No, like I'm not I'm not just saying that. They don't make them like that anymore. I know. I'm telling you, I can't even like take care of a cat. How could she take care of seven kids alone in a foreign country with no help, with no family? That's crazy, insane. With no help. <laughs> Mothers are strong. They are strong. Mothers are strong even but but by yesterday's standards, they were a different breed. Yeah. Um father how or what word comes to mind when you think of him a warrior he's mm. a warrior he fought so many battles on his own he was an orphan um, from a very young age oh wow and um let's say he didn't have the best circumstances and he didn't give up he studied and left his family from i think he was he started working when he was 10 years old and he left his family by the age of 16 and moved abroad to study university but still didn't give up he also studied his masters in the states and then a phd in london and then another phd in um, scotland he um, it wasn't easy for him it wasn't easy for him so every time i complain about life i look back and think oh, I'm being too spoiled. I mean, look what my dad or mom went through to get to where I am. They had to fight bigger battles. Perspective. Yeah. When you put things into perspective, you realize that nine times out of 10, we have nothing to complain about. Exactly. Would you say he's the person who you look up to most? Yes. Mm -hmm. When I was um, really young and we used to have we we would write about our role models essays i would always write about him amazing does he watch my podcast he will he will (laughs) now now he will after this yeah (laughs) amazing okay 27 years old uh you know one day inshallah you, you will find someone who you would like to marry what are the three things that you specifically look for in a partner okay i'm gonna be honest with you i'm gonna tell you something i don't really like talking about, especially to men. I have a list of, um, let's say, around 35 traits I want in my future partner. 35 traits? Yeah. Some of them are very like silly, like I want him to love animals, to love traveling, but some of them are very um, yeah, that means something core to you. values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, go through the list. Let's go. No, Number one. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I had to narrow it down to three traits, I would choose a man of uh, values. Um, and so many things uh, lie under mm-hmm. values. He has values. Um, fear of God, khawf min Allah. I think that's something so important. And these days, people don't focus on that. Because if Allah, he would take care of me. He would never harm me. No. And um, so this is one, values and fear of God. And the second would be respect. Respect not only by words. Respect me, my mentality, my feelings, my family, my friends, my choices, my career. Respect me. Yeah. Respect me even in his thoughts, you know? Um, it's, uh, it's everything that of course yeah. I mean I could live with someone that has values and respects me but doesn't love me I don't need someone to be crazy in love with me to marry him 
And the last one would be intellect. Mm-hmm. I think I, I I can't imagine myself with someone that's of lower intelligence. Mm, or like at least well educated, you know, someone I can have a conversation of with. Of course. I, I love those four, three or four things that you said because they're all characteristic things. You know, it's not like uh, physical things or, you know, you 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 want him to, uh, you know, be into this or be six foot three or no, it's it's the soul. It all points to the soul, you know, being respectful or um, putting God first and being a God fearing man, um, being intellectual or smart. Those are all great, if great traits. If my partner traits. had these traits, I know I would be in safe hands. Yeah. Of course, I would love like other things, um, like let's say financial, let's say finance or like physical appearance, but the essential, the core values Mm. have to be these three. Totally, totally. And then they're honestly, they're they're the most important things to to, to look for in a partner. Um, And inshallah, that's something that that you'll get. Uh, You put great energy out there. And um, and inshallah comes back to you. You said that you believe everything good happened to you in your life uh, happened because you attracted it. Yes. Something you said when we spoke on the phone. Um, is is that life secret? Would you say to be happy that you put that good energy out mm-hmm. there and, and then it comes back? I think that's one of life's secrets. I believe everything good is coming my way. And when you have a mentality like that and you're that optimistic, what could go wrong? And alhamdulillah, everything good comes my way. Even when uh, the setbacks or defeats come my way, I know it's good for a good reason. I truly believe in that you attract everything in your life. So I attracted being here. I watched your show, I loved your show, and I imagined myself being on your show before actually coming here. Did you know that? No, I didn't. It's funny that I, I reached out to you. Yeah, <laughs> you attract everything into your life. And I'm not saying that in a spiritual... I know what you mean. I know what you mean. You know, I, I don't want to go into religion, yeah. but like even it's it's been well known even way before تفاعلوا بالخير تجدوا. You know, we, we've had these sayings from a very long time and only a few people act by them. So I really truly believe in that I am where I am here because I attracted that. This is uh, this is as real as it gets. This is any... Uh... If you read the book, The Secret, which is one of the most uh, best-selling books in the universe of all time it talks about the law of attraction you can cure uh, you can cure cancer you can cure disabilities you can do unbelievable things attract the love of your life quit smoking just by the law of attraction just by not actually repeating it not believing it from inside you it has to come from within you you actually have to believe that it's coming your way it's almost like you are what you attract and and it reminds me of a saying that I love by Naval that the word that the world is uh, basically a reflection of your feelings. If you leave the house in the morning and you have a good attitude, then good things happen. But if you're sulking and cussing and then that's all you're gonna see. Yeah, like imagine if someone had a bad attitude towards uh, his life and he was like. I'm gonna die. I don't want to do anything. How do you think his life is gonna be? Is it gonna be good? Okay. No. There was a study in Japan where there were scientists who would talk positively towards rice, and in another room, scientists talking negatively towards rice. You're the worst rice. You stink. You're not even white. You're, and then we love you, rice. You're the best. You're. Yeah. But the rice that was spoken to positively stayed fresh. And in a day or two, the one that was spoken to negatively had maggots and all the disgusting things that were in it from the power of positivity and power of word of word but isn't that just insane you know there is something i i always think of even when allah created this world or created humans he said 
كن فيكون why didn't he like blink an eye or point or do something or just think of it why did he say it why was it said just to demonstrate the power of word i love that i love that كن فيكون i need to use that more often what a great uh... power of word yeah yeah it really for those who don't believe in this kind of thing but they he, don't have to i don't and um, discuss th- uh, these subjects with people who don't believe in it but it's fine but to open their eyes on on something you know, that it's, they it's like the law of gravity if you don't believe in gravity does it mean it's not there yeah it, it, it is works. it is but yeah it works whether you believe in it or not, not. it's still there yeah But drawing people's attention to the fact that it does exist and this is why can change a non-believer to a believer. Yes. And the kun for yakun one is a great example of, uh, of, of, of God putting that into practice. You know, um, nothing happens in religion just like that. Everything is very precisely thought through. Yeah. And why did Allah let us know that he said kun for yakun? We should think of that. Yeah. I mean, there, obviously there's a reason that just to demonstrate the power of word. Yeah. Words are so powerful. Again, almost like how it took him seven days to build the universe. Yeah, Everything takes time. Of course he could have done it in a second. He's a creator, he can do anything. Yeah. Why would he take seven days to seven days. build the universe yeah. or create the universe? I love these topics because they just make you think. Um... Look, there's something people don't understand about um, energy or, the, or uh, the law of attraction, which is they think it goes against religion, which is the complete opposite. Energy and religion align. They go with each other. And that's something I think that not everyone knows. That's why so many people attack Um, life coaches or um, yoga instructors. Yoga, yeah, it's misconstrued. Yeah. But... And quick to dismiss. Like, oh, no, no, don't. Some people do it wrong, I know. Especially on social media, some people don't portray it the correct way, but it doesn't mean that they're right. Mm. No. Totally. Something that's improved your life so much, Rahaf. Stop waiting for the right time. Because there is no right time. No one is going to be 100% ready for anything. You have to do what you can, work it through, and then just go for it. It's even better to do it when you're not ready. So you get rid of the, you get rid of the setbacks and the failures early so you can enjoy the success. Yeah. And, and you've, you've experienced just that, that not waiting for the perfect time actually ended up serving you. Yeah. put yourself in these uncomfortable situations. Like I have to go back to Napoli because I feel like that was the most, one of, one of the most, one of the most uncomfortable uh, positions that you found yourself in, but you persevered. Yeah. Now you want to do it again. You come back I'm with experience. I'm doing it today. <laughs> yeah, with, with this, for example. Yeah. If there's no Napoli, there's no this. Am I, is, is that a correct assumption? Um, I think that that's true. Yeah. 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 But, This is what we have to do to grow and to succeed. You have to push yourself. You have to get out of your comfort zone. One of my favorite episodes, Sara Atheri, episode mm-hmm. 75. With all due respect to all the people that I've had on, fortunate enough to have on, Sara dropped the mother of all quotes on me. She said, jump as far outside of your comfort zone as possible. Do that consistently over time. until the boundaries of your comfort zone encompass so much that very little ends up intimidating you. Wow. I'm like, you nailed it. And this just came in passing. You know, we were talking about, you know, putting yourself out there and all that. And she just said, she just went right into it. Jump, uh, jump as far outside of your comfort zone as possible. Do that consistently over time until the boundaries of your comfort zone encompass so much that very little ends up intimidating you. I actually saw her episode and I thought to myself, how am I going to go on the show after her? She after. was, she had um, an amazing episode and she was very well articulated and said everything right. Shufi, everyone comes with their own little magic, okay? Is she an articulate 
genius. Yes, she, she is, is in her own right. But everyone, I believe that everyone has something amazing in them. But most people don't know what it is. And when you find out what it is, does it give you confidence? Does it give you maybe a new career? Does it give you belief? But I feel like God made everyone with something that they are amazing in. I really believe that. Yeah. And getting out of your comfort zone puts you in a position where you can determine one day what that is. It'll get you closer to finding out what are you amazing in. What would you say is the one thing that stops people from achieving their goals? Not taking enough risk. Risk. Yeah. Not taking enough risk is a recipe to failure. Mm. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg once said that the biggest risk you can do in life is not taking risk. Yeah. It's a guaranteed recipe to failure. And that's so true, by the way. Exactly. Nothing so uh, meaningful comes out from just being within your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing meaningful comes from comfort zone. Nothing meaningful comes from easy either. And I've noticed that when you're uncomfortable, it's hard. And that's where it's challenging. And yeah. us as humans, we fear failure and that's fine. It's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with failing. Yeah. We just have to get to a point to accept failing. It's fine. You can fail once. After you fail, you're a step closer to success or your goals or your dreams. Failure has a wrong reputation. Um, it's a sign that you're, I wish it's reputation and I wish people perceived it as a sign of that you're trying and uh, look at it as a process of elimination. Okay, that didn't work for me. No problem. Let me adjust it and try something else now since we know that that didn't work. I'll come at, come at it from a different I angle. I think this is like the bul uh, light bulb. When yeah. they first discovered it, it was after 1,001 tries. Mm -hmm. So he failed 1,000 times until they discovered electricity. Mm -hmm. Until he got that. Edison, right? Was it? The I guy who, so. yeah, Thomas Edison. Uh, I just made up that name. I wanted to look smart. No, I'm kidding. I think it is. I, th <laughs> I, th I think it is Edison. When I asked you what stresses you out, you said wasting time and what an answer that is. I should have followed up, but I'm going to follow up with it now. What in life is the biggest waste of time? One of the biggest time wasters I see in life is people pleasing. Mm. Trying to please people wastes so much time and energy and potential. And just throws it all away for what? Those people like don't even care about you. I've been a big victim of that for most of my life. We all have. I hate it. The second you stop trying to please people, your life is going to change. Dramatically. Yeah. Um, there was a question I asked myself a few years ago. If I had to choose between pleasing people or pleasing myself, what would I choose? It's a simple question, but to actually be honest and have the courage to say it isn't as easy. I chose myself. Good. And um, that's one of the best decisions I've ever done or had in my life. When I was studying medicine, I was um, in a private uh, school and the community was small. Everyone knew everyone. And uh, people were talking about me. I know that for a fact. They were making fun of me. And I just thought, why are you making fun of me? I'm studying and I'm uh, doing a job that I love and I'm getting paid. Why are you making fun of me? You know, and in the beginning, it used to affect me, but with time, I just ignored it. There will always be naysayers. And you just have to let them be like white noise in the background. Wasn't easy to ignore them and say that, that tell yourself that they're not going to bother you? I tell myself that they, they, they're not going to bother me, but it does bother me. It does, yeah no matter how strong you are, people's words do affect you. Mm -hmm. And when I say um, stop people pleasing, doesn't mean like, oh, I don't care about the community, the society, my family, I'm going to do whatever. No, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. 
to, I mean, with, with certain limits. Don't let people's opinion d- direct you or define you, you know? Love the saying that what people say behind your back is none of your business. Or people's opinion is none of my business. Yeah. They can think the most, uh, the most important thing is what I think of myself, my opinion. Yeah. And if you can drown that noise out, or as you said, white noise, or I think it's it's the biggest superpower in the modern I think it's era. Saves so much time and energy. Yeah, yeah. Because I have been involved in corporate relationships that drove me crazy. And the moment I said, "Don't pay any more attention to that," the best advice I picked up or gave myself was uh, cut them off and move on. Mm. The best revenge is living well. But for years, Rahaf, I was battling and battling and corporate relationships are very awkward, very awkward. They're taxing on your mental health. And then six months ago, I said, I'm not going to give it any more of my time. And I've lived happily ever after. Alhamdulillah. I'm so happy for you. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were talking about how you hear people saying X, Y, Z behind your back and you told yourself that... does she think she is? She's Saudi. How does she think she's going to become a model? Um, She's from this family. She's from this place. No one's going to allow her. I don't know what. And I used to hear that. And then with time, when I did make it and I did start modeling, they would come up to me and say, oh, I saw your picture. You looked really nice. And then now they text me or message me on Instagram saying, hey, do you remember me? I was in class with you. Yeah. All of a sudden, they uh, they want to pretend that they that they yeah. knew it all along. Tell them to keep that same energy that they had 10 years ago, however long ago it was. That's, by the way, uh, indirect validation. Call it whatever you want. That I made it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Own that. I love that you own that shit. It's beautiful. Um, okay. Random one. Favorite movie? Mm. I think my favorite movie was also the first movie I've ever watched. First one you ever watched? Yeah. The Wizard of Oz. Do you know it? Classic. Are you kidding me? Such a good movie. I'll watch it again today. I've probably seen it 50 times. It's amazing, especially um, when children watch it because I hold, there's a moral behind it. So I'm just going to a recap or uh, explain in short what the movie's about. So there, there's a, a young girl called uh, Dorothy. She gets taken into a magical uh, world. And on the way, she meets three people. Tin Man, who doesn't have a brain. A uh, scarecrow, the, yes. who doesn't have a heart. Or uh, the opposite. the Heart. Yeah. Lion courage. Yeah, and the lion that doesn't have courage. So um, uh, they go uh, together through this road trying to look for the uh, great wizard of Oz that would grant them their wishes and give the lion courage and give the tin man a heart and give the scarecrow um, a brain. When they reach the wizard of Oz, he tells them and gives them tokens that what they're looking for is already within them. They just had to believe it. Yeah, it's a great uh, moral of the story. It's very good for children to watch too. Yeah, 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 truly. Um, do you know if I was to ask you to guess how old the movie is, how many years would you give it? Um, I know it's it's really old. I think like seventy. Ninety. Wow. Came out in thirty nine. Wow. Right? Like, I didn't know movies were made like that in 39. Is it black and white? Because I saw it colored. No, it eventually goes color. Mm. Um, Sorry. Yeah, well. The, they so, color it, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think when you eventually see the yellow brick road, it goes into, you see the the, the yellow brick yeah. road being yellow and then Emerald City, you see that. Um, but just shy of 90 years, it's, it's 
it's crazy. It's and, and still until this day, it's one of the best movies in history. It, it is. It is. All time. And then they digitally remastered it, so you can watch it now in, in proper HD. And they've done that with a few movies. Jaws, I think, was one of them, and these mm-hmm. classic ones, Terminator, where they make it on the pretty much HD or 4K today. That's something I want to watch again. Thank you for bringing that movie to my attention. On IMDb, which is the app I go to before I watch any movie, so I don't waste my time. And if you don't do this, get on it. Uh, 8.1 out of 10, which is very, very, very high. Finish the sentence, Rahaf. Mm-hmm. I feel most alive when? When I give back. Giving back to my family. Giving back to my community, to my country, to my mother. Just the feeling of giving back, I think, gives me a value as a human being. Beautiful. The thing I value most in life is? My integrity. Always doing the right thing, no matter the circumstances, no matter how hard it gets, I always have to do the right thing. No matter who's looking. Exactly, even if no one knows, I'm doing the right thing. I will do the right thing. People who have so much potential, like the same me and you, um, could be, there could be someone just like me in a refugee somewhere mm. that has no, no future, no dreams. I don't know, this just makes me cry that I could, I, I was so fortunate enough to be able to have been educated and raised in a good family and have all the blessings I have in my life, where someone with, she could be prettier than me, smarter than me, have more potential, more hardworking than me, but her circumstances did her injustice and she's somewhere being raped or abused. Saddest thing in the world. Yeah. Opportunity and no opportunity. Injustice. Injustice. It's like, how do you even make sense of that? Why is it that we have safety and security? We know where our meals are coming from. And some people, their biggest stress in life is not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. Yeah. That's, that's, it's, you, you sit there and you think, the, the, I'm never going to complain about anything again in my life. That's something to think about next time I'm having a bad day. Huh. I wish I knew this when I was younger. Adults don't even know what they're doing. Damn right. So it's okay to stumble and don't know what you're doing or where you're going exactly. Just go for it and make mistakes and take risks. It's okay. It's fine. No one knows what they're doing exactly. Even if you take calculated risks and opportunities, you're still ha- you're at you're still at the risk of failure, you know. And I just thought, uh, looking up to adults, that they knew how their life was going to turn out and they had everything um, already planned. So like 15 years ago, if you asked me, where would you be at 27? I would tell you probably I'm married with kids, a stable job. And look at me now, I'm 27, still stumbling and um, searching for myself. But happy. Alhamdulillah, can never complain. I uh, saw an Instagram post two weeks ago saying, let your child make mistakes. And I realized, my wife and I realized that when a mistake happens, we're quick to correct and no, you know, you, you need to be more careful. Then we said, actually, she told me, she's like, she sent it to me. She's like, Mo, he needs to make mistakes. Yeah. Let it, let, let him make mistakes. That was no, no problem. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But to say, not that we said that, but to live life trying to prevent your child from making a mistake is is not the way to go through life. You learn from that mistake. Of course. Mistake is proof of trying. Totally, totally. I want to be remembered as a... As a kind heart. I know it's so simple, but if I would um, disappear tomorrow, I want everyone to remember me that she had a kind heart. She was a giver. You say it like it's not something big, but if 50% of 
humanity had that, the world would be a totally different place. So it's huge if you saying a kind heart. The depth of it. The is depth huge. of it. The depth of it. Exactly. <clears throat> okay, this or that. Would you rather be too hot or too cold? Physically? Yeah, I mean, like. Uh, I mean, the weather. You weather, mean? yeah. Okay, Ice, okay. Iceland or, or uh, 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 one of the resorts on the Red Sea? Um. No, this is a hard. Uh, okay, wait. This. Then I'll put it for you in a different way. Okay. Uh, but I need the answers to be quick, okay? It was a slow start. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, skiing, holiday, or beach resort? Beach. Fly or drive? Fly. Still or sparkling water? Still. Aisle seat or window? Window. Phone call or text? Phone call. Ooh. Introvert or extrovert? Introvert. Book or movie? Movie. Would you rather live in the city or the suburbs? Um, city. Give it a few years. Uh, <laughs> meat or chicken? That was a joke. Uh, pa <laughs> after everything I told you. <laughs> yeah. After the my trauma. My humor is so bad. My humor is so bad. I'm so sorry. Um, pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Spicy or non-spicy? Spicy. Comedy or horror? Comedy. Brad Pitt or Leonardo? Leonardo. <laughs> that came from the heart. Uh, go out or Netflix and chill? Go out. Feared or loved? Loved. 90s or modern era? Mm, 90s. Heels or flats? Heels. I think I got to know you so much better in the last 20 seconds uh. then. <laughs> so you want to be a person that sits on an aisle on a window seat to a beach holiday who eats meat, non-spicy food, to meet Leonardo DiCaprio, to go out and uh, wear, wear, heels. Or wear, wear heels. Yeah. Wow, almost got, almost I like got, it. Almost got it, almost got it. If you were to have a conversation today with your 12-year-old self, what do you think your 12-year-old self would be most surprised of the person you have become? Most surprised? I think um, she'd be really surprised of how strong I am. Of, um, and she'd be really proud of everything I've done, not only for me, but for us, for our dream, mm -hmm. the battles I had to go through and fight to uh, be where I am today. I think she'd be really, really proud of me. And I did that not just for me, I did that for her because she deserves it. And even though she was a shy, quiet girl, but she deserves to be happy. You hear a lot about uh, protect your inner child. Yeah. And it kind of touches on exactly what you're saying right now. Yeah, your yeah. inner child is still within you. You have to take care of it from mm -hmm. time to time. Mm -hmm. Check up, see what it needs. Are there any dreams that you haven't fulfilled? Or is there anything that you would want to do as a child and you didn't get to do? You should do it. Do you keep a journal? Is that something you do part of your daily routine? No, but I was, um, I'm planning to keep a gratitude journal. Hmm. What does a day look like for you? Typical mm. time you up. I'm up, let's say, by eight in the morning. I go to hospital. I finish by three or four p.m. And then it depends. Most maybe sometimes I have photo shoots. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do yoga. Sometimes I have piano classes. Sometimes I just sit with my family. Piano classes. Yeah. Interesting. I knew something was going to come up that that we didn't discuss. I, I took already uh, 24 piano classes, and I can't say I'm um, that good. It's okay. Uh, it's good for the soul, though. Yeah. That creative I, uh, part know, of the I brain. You know, I heard that learning the piano can make you good at math. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah, it it, it, it works the creative side of your brain, and m music music is, is important. Um, and, I, and I appreciate, actually, how serious Ministry of Culture now is, mm. is taking music um, with... Uh, 
it's amazing how everything is becoming <laughs> yeah. very accessible. Accessible, to us. accessible. That's the word. Yeah, yeah. Dinner or a coffee with anyone, dead or alive, who would you choose? Take your time. Mm. Dinner or coffee, dead or alive. Dead or alive. I think it would be um, dinner with one of my aunts. I haven't seen her in um, a very long time. And uh, she is like a mother figure to me. You're, you're, real, you're really fam family oriented, huh? Yeah. I love being within my family. Mm. Maybe because I grew abroad and I didn't have you know, family around me all the time. So now I really appreciate it and cherish it. Yeah. If you were to have the power to change anything that you've been through, uh, is there something that you would want to do over or change? Anything that I've been through? Mm. Would you change anything about your life if you were to be born again? I think I would change um, my the way I reacted towards things. I I trust people so easily. Till today? <laughs> Unfortunately, I try to convince myself that I don't, and I learned my lesson, but yes, I do. What's your star sign? I'm Scorpio. My twins are too. November 9th. I'm November 5th. And are Scorpios known to, uh, to, to, to have that attribute where they trust easily? No, mm. they don't trust anyone. <laughs> It's true. Scorpios don't trust anyone. <laughs> They're very secretive. My best friend is a Scorpio. Um, I like to think that he trusts me. Um, but you do. You, you trust blindly and quickly. No, not quickly. But when I trust, like I throw it all, all in. out in there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's very hard for me to trust someone. But once I do, like, it's crazy. Yeah. I become insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hate that. And I, I wish I could change it. Rahaf, what in life makes you happy, puts the biggest smile on your face? Nothing in life compares to the happiness and joy I get when I make my mother happy. I know it might sound like a simple answer, but everyone likes seeing their mother happy, but I swear to you, nothing compares to the joy and happiness I feel when I see that she's happy because of me. Okay, I'm happy when I buy something I've always wanted or go to a place that's been on my bucket list, but nothing makes my heart melt from happiness as much as uh, seeing her happy because of something I did. And sometimes it could be so simple. Sometimes she just needs someone that listens to her, you know? Do you take her out to meals? Do you guys like all the time? Cook? Yeah, I spend now every weekend with her, mm. and you know that's something my twelve-year-old um, would be very surprised because I wasn't very uh, close to her growing up as a child or a teenager. Let's just say after COVID, we became friends like best friends. Wow, how about that? Yeah, she would just call me and say, "You let off, come home. Let's go to ha let's go have dinner somewhere. I feel like going out." Would you say you're her favorite? To be honest, I am. <laughs> Again, uh, I love that you own that and you're probably thinking my siblings are going to see this, but I don't, uh, I have to be. Yeah. That's really sweet. That's really, really sweet. Um, having um, your mother's blessing or Ridal Walden is it's everything in life. Of course, of yeah. course, Yani. If my mother wasn't happy or praying for me, I wouldn't have done anything. No. I would be nothing without my mother. Yeah. I feel nothing. the same way too. Yeah. And she deserves everything. She sacrificed her life for us and for me and my siblings. Anything I do is still, is still nothing compared to what she's done. Seven, seven kids in 10 years, three continents. That's, that's what I leave this episode with, one of the main things. Yeah. Inshallah. You said it, they don't make them these days. No. 
It's like the car era. It was great in the 60s and 70s <laughs> and 80s, and now it's all plastic. Not to compare them, not to compare mothers with cars, but like really, they don't yeah. make mothers like that anymore. And again, not to take oh, anything away from my cousins, my wife, but but even my cousins, my girl cousins and my wife would say, our moms were different. They were different. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, yeah, it's a fact. Uh, thank you really so much for coming on and uh, and you know going where you've never been before and to open up so candidly it doesn't for a second feel like it's your first podcast or long form conversation very honest very raw and may this be uh, the start of many more opportunities that you say yes to with regards to this because you're good at it wallah and you have a great head on your shoulders wallah al azim with the moves that you have done that required bravery, with your kind and gentle soul, with just so many things that you shared with me, just really, you are such a great human being. So thank you, Rahaf, I can't stop saying it. Thank you, Mo, for having me. And thank you for giving me and people like me a platform to express ourselves that wasn't there before. And that you do very well, by the way, expressing yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Best of luck in everything you do. May you go out and grab Miss Universe Award, and then you can come back on the show and tell us all about it and what happens backstage. And uh, and best of luck as well in, in the field of medicine and in all these super diverse things that you choose to pursue. Thank you so much for having me again, and thank you for your kind and warm welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. You know how, how nervous I was getting on the show, and now I feel amazing. Yeah, you know, I, I told you that it's not going to show. You know, you, you pushed me out of my comfort zone, and I owe you for that. No, you don't owe me anything. You, Thank you. You, you, you paid me back by coming on the show. Thank you so much, Sahaf.